the, um, this piece comes after a description of the final, the last few minutes of Kennedy's plane crash, ending um, in his plane uh, going into what's called a spiral dive uh, into the ocean. Kennedy's mistake was that he failed to keep his wings level. That was critical because when a plane banks to one side, it begins to turn and its wings lose some of their vertical lift. Left unchecked, this process accelerates. The angle of the bank increases, the turn gets sharper and sharper, and the plane starts to dive towards the ground in an ever-narrowing corkscrew. Pilots call this the graveyard spiral. So why didn't Kennedy stop the dive? Because in times of low visibility and high stress, keeping your wings level, indeed even knowing whether you are in a gra graveyard spiral, turns out to be surprisingly difficult. Had Kennedy been flying during the day or with a clear moon, he would have been fine. If you are the pilot looking straight ahead from the cockpit, the angle of your wings will be obvious from the straight line of the horizon in front of you. But when it's dark outside, the horizon disappears. There is no external measure of the plane's bank. On the ground, we know whether we're level even when it's dark because of the motion sensing mechanisms of the inner ear. In a spiral dive, though, the effect of the, plane, of the plane's g-force on the inner ear means that the pilot feels, feels perfectly level, even if his plane is not. Similarly, when you're in a jetliner that's, that's banking at 30 degrees after takeoff, the book on your neighbor's lap does not slide onto your nap, lap, nor will a pen on the floor roll towards the downside of the plane. The physics of flying is such that an airplane in the midst of a turn always feels perfectly level to someone inside the cabin. This is a difficult notion, and to understand it, I went flying with William Langavisha, the author of a superb book on flying inside the sky. We met at San Jose Airport in the jet center where the Silicon Valley billionaires keep their private planes. We took off at dusk, heading out towards Monterey Bay until we had left the lights of the coast behind and night had erased the horizon. Langavisha let the plane bank gently to the left. He took his hands off the stick. The sky told me nothing now, so I concentrated on the instruments. The nose of the plane was dropping. The gyroscope told me that we were banking first, 30, first 15, then 30, then 45 degrees. We're in a spiral dive, Langavisha said calmly. Our airspeed was steadily accelerating from 180 to 190 to 200 knots. The needle on the altimeter was moving down. The plane was dropping like a stone at 3,000 feet per minute. I could hear, faintly, a slight increase in the hum of the engine and the wind noise as we picked up speed. But if, Langevish, but if Langevish and I had been talking, I would have caught none of that. Had the cabin been unpressurized, my ears might have popped, particularly as we went into the steep part of the dive. But beyond that, nothing at all. In a spiral dive, the G-load, the force of inertia, is normal. As Langevisha puts it, the plane likes to spiral dive. The total time elapsed since we started diving was no more than six or seven seconds. Suddenly, Langevisha straightened the wings and pulled back on the stick to get the nose of the plane up, breaking out of the dive. Only now did I feel the full force of the G-load, throwing me back in my seat. You feel no G-load in a bank, Langevisha said. There's nothing more confusing for the uninitiated. Un uninitiated. I asked Langavisha how much longer we could have fallen before we plunged into the sea like John F. Kennedy Jr. About five seconds, he said. Thank you. Oh.